Hello, South Strong Nation, Joe Simons, Lee Diamonds. We are back again talking all about tides. Got my bro, Luke Simons. Luke, when was the last time you got a haircut, my friend? Um, well, usually I would say by like weeks, but uh, but now I'm I'm really measuring in years, and uh, so it was back in back in 2019, Joe. Ooh, still still holding strong. Not bad, dude. So uh, <laughs> June 2020. Let's see if you can make it all the way a full year. That's the um, yeah. Just see if I can go haircut free. I don't know. I'm sure I'll get tired after a little while, but uh, so far it's been good luck, man. I've been I've been having a good bite, and uh, it's just been getting better and better. So why? Why mess up a good thing? You know? Oh yeah, it looks like a combination of Jesus and a Duck Dynasty there. So, <laughs> you know, good news is we get to rely on you to learn all about tides. So, long story short, tides are incredibly important. These tide stations and the tide charts that we all have seen and grown up with, they're incredibly accurate most of the time. And, and we're going to talk about when they're accurate. There are also some times when they're completely inaccurate. And we're going to talk about why that would happen, what variables cause that to happen. And then we're going to actually get on some maps, right, Luke, and, and show some like real life examples of, of how wind and rain and fronts and pressure systems can change these tide charts and exactly what you need to know to make sure that one, you're fishing at a time in your area where you've got good flow because that's going to help increase the amount of strikes that you get we all know that you know especially our favorite inshore saltwater fish they love current and we also want to make sure you don't ever get stuck uh back anywhere in a, if, whether it's a bay or a back in a creek uh there is nothing worse than being stuck there at many times uh for an hour or many many hours so um i'm going to talk all, all about that and we also help create this site called Smart Fishing Tides, we we saw a problem out there with some of just the, the the tide websites and apps that were being used. Some of them had just so much stuff. It was like, it, it didn't even mean anything. We wanted something that was simple. Plus it was really built for inshore saltwater anglers that would show you guys exactly what's going on, what you need to know with both the tides, the wind, the wind direction. And, uh, and of course that strike score, which is incredibly popular that is, is kind of a predictive analysis tool to show you when you should go out there and fish to maximize the times you can catch an inshore slam. And it's, it's eerily accurate. Um, we've, uh, we've got so many testimonials of people that have, I think, what is it? It's over a nine. It's, it's basically on a scale from, from one to 10. And if it's a nine something, 9.1 to 9.8, it will say, actually call your boss and uh, call in sick and go fishing today. Yeah, and, and the reason, uh, the reason, first of all, that tide tables are always accurate for the variables that they predict, which and, are, which is the the moon and the sun, right? Okay. Because those are those there's those the moon and the sun have been traveling the same speed for a very long time, and they're not going to change anytime soon. And these tide projections are using that as a core factor. What they don't do, what they don't measure, are the the more real time stuff like wind speed, wind direction, change of speed, um, change of pressure. And obviously because it can't, because that changes all the time. And so those are the variables that we, we as fishermen need to know about and think about and know how, how they impact the completely accurate tide graphs. Um, because unless the, unless the wind is perfectly calm and the pressure is totally normal, you know, those tide graphs are perfect, but, that, that's rarely the case. So we need to know how that curve is going to change based on the conditions that we're facing. So, yeah, and, and real quick too, if you're wondering, Hey, is this for me? This is not for beginners. I mean, it, it obviously it applies to beginners as well, but this is going to be some advanced stuff. However, let's start on the beginner side, just to kind of cover the basics on a reading a tide chart. Can you pull up, maybe share your screen, Luke, and, and pull up smartfishingtides.com and we can look at just kind of a general tide chart. Maybe we'll show one for the Gulf and then one for the East Coast as, uh, as well and see the differences here. So what do we got, Sebastian? Yes, Inlet? so this is one over in Sebastian. And, um, and so the East Coast tide charts are, are easier. It's, it's more consistent. There's gonna, be, there's gonna be a high, and then basically every six hours, they'll go from a high to a low, another six hours to another high, and, and vice versa, they'll keep going. The peaks are relatively the same. We'll kind of scroll day by day. 
and just so you know, wherever you are, um, it's not, you know, it's with, within a, a minute or two accuracy. If you see, if you get into a good bite, if there's like the, the perfect tide, say at, at, at noon, someday that you're fishing, um, the tide is gonna be the same tide the next day, all else being equal, about 50 minutes later. So as we scroll day by day by day, the curve, right, those peaks are shifting about 50 minutes. Why 50? And, because that's, that's the speed of the, the moon. It's, it's about the, again, it's about the moon, the moon and the sun moving around the earth. So you don't have to know the details, just know 50 minutes, day by day, and you're good. Gravitational pull, baby, gravitational that's, pull. Well, it's, it's, the, it's the speed of the moon relative to the speed of the earth going around, or the earth going around the sun relative to the moon going around the earth. All what you about, know for, the, what about for the people that believe the earth is flat? <laughs> you're on your own. Do we, have a tide, do we have a tide chart for people that believe the earth is still flat? <laughs> I'm not, I don't think, yeah, I don't, I don't think they will believe in tides either, I assume. <laughs> um, so, um, so the, the, the core, so these tide tables, again, as we said before, are totally accurate based on the moon and the sun. Those are the core variables. Those are the most impactful variables. Um, but on some situations where the wind is crazy strong, uh, or even the wind is moderately strong, makes a difference. And, and that's when we really need to, um, to use our brains uh, to actually know how it's gonna change. And so, so here's the Atlantic. We mentioned uh, the Gulf being different. So here is a Gulf, let me just go get a different one. This, this tide table is, um, is a little bit odd looking. So I'll go one over, over Boca Grande. Um, and again, this, is, yeah, this is this is smart fishing tides, and uh, yeah, the cool thing is it has a strike score, so you can get a, just a quick synopsis on the daily, you know, the, the daily uh, projection. You know, this day is going to be better than than the other, and then further down, it gives the hourly projections. So again, a lot of people don't have all day to fish. Um, I wish I did. I don't either, and so I use this to know, okay, if I'm gonna if I only have three hours to fish. Um, this day in particular, based on the tides and the weather, like the unique thing about our system is that it incorporates the, the weather as well. Um, then I need to go, I know I need to go in the morning. So uh, day by day, let's look at a day by day chart. So this, this is Gulf. Again, remember the Atlantic was very symmetrical. There was a high, there was a low, they were six hours apart and they were relatively, the, the highs were relatively the same and the lows were relatively the same. That's not the case on the Gulf. The Gulf is, has a little bit more complexity because it's the, uh, it's basically the, you know, the, the Atlantic Ocean is the major contributor and then it has to wrap around the state of Florida and it starts having all these weird things. But again, the tide tables are good as long as we only, as long as the wind and the pressure aren't impacting things. Um, and so when they are, we just know, we just, again, just like the Atlantic side, we just need to know how to account for it when, when making our, our plans. Um, so you can see, you know, this, they just change a lot. And, uh, and again, although it changes, uh, still use the chart and then just know how to make the adjustments from the chart. So maybe let's give an example, Luke. Um, let's start with when, because you got wind, you got pressure systems, you've got, I mean, even rain, right? I, obviously, you know, uh, a, a hurricane obviously changes a lot, but even just multiple days of a ton of rain, all of a sudden places like, let's just say Boca Grande, you got the Peace River now pushing tons of water out in Charlotte Harbor and that changes stuff. So kind of give some examples, maybe starting with, uh, with the wind on, on how this would change the tide. Yeah, wind, wind is, is the biggest factor that I've seen. Like rain kind of is, uh, but in, like in a big bay, like rain isn't much of a factor unless it's like a hurricane sitting on, t on top of somewhere for a while. But, but wind, so wind is the number one thing to think about. That is the biggest factor on getting away from the normal curve uh, because wind is, is pushing a lot of, every wave you see, that is, that is the wind actually pushing, pushing the water uh, you know, in, in whatever direction the wind is blowing. And so the thing to think about is, uh, we'll just look at the Gulf, for instance, is, you know, which way is the wind blowing? So if it's if like we're in Tampa, basically, if we get an east wind, uh, we just need to know automatically that the tides are going to be lower than normal, lower than the, the tide table. And ex explain why for the people that don't don't yep. see that. And because we have, we have people who are also, also uh, listening via the, via the iTunes, Stitcher, et cetera. 
Yeah, absolutely. So again, the reason why is because that wind is actually pushing the water. It is pushing the water in whichever direction it's blowing. It's, it's you know, wind has friction on the water surface. And as that, as that wind is blowing, that friction on the water surface is literally pushing the water. Obviously, if it's like a one or two mile an hour wind, it's not pushing very much. You don't really need to think about it. But if we're talking 15 miles or more, even 10 sometimes, but at least 15 and definitely 20 plus, it's a really big factor. And, and just like a, an extreme factor. So east wind, it'll be, we just know, we need to know automatically that it's going to be pushing water out. And so that's going to, that's going to have a, the, the, whatever the tide table was, let's go back to the tide table. Um, let's say Thursday, the wind's current. Actually, this day, it's only going by six or seven. So again, another cool thing about these tide tables, you can see the wind right there next to so Let's see if we can go find a windy day. Man, we have some good weather coming up. Yeah. Uh, the other, I, I know we're talking about Tampa, but I saw uh, Sebastian had some, some double digits. Yeah. So uh, in this case, uh, there's not any extreme wind. That's actually great. We've, we've had a windy, uh, a windy summer so far. Our time um, is due. Our time is due. Time is due. So again, just look at the wind. If it's like 15 plus, I mean, just know that it could be like a six inch difference on, on the tides. I mean, it really depends on, on where you are, but, but it, it makes a big factor. And, and there's no, the trouble with it is that there's no like perfect way to know exactly how much it is because is it every, every area is different. Um, so that's like the only bad thing is that there's not a, this isn't precision. It's just a general. And, uh, and so I, when I have a wind that's like 15, uh, plus, I just automatically assume that the, the, the actual height of the water is going to be like six inches to a foot, uh, less than what it normally would be. And then what about the timing of the, of the tide chart? So we got, we, we know that if you're in Tampa, it's pushing, you know, east is pushing everything out towards the Gulf. So you're going to have lower tides. How does that actually affect the tide chart? Meaning if it said it was going to be high tide at noon on the dot, is, is it now that impacted as well or, or not? No, I mean, so that's the change. The change of wind is what will actually change, a, a, will impact a change of tide time. Um, like say the, the, tide, the wind's just going 20 miles an hour for five days in a row. Um, that middle day is going to, the, the actual change of the water from going low to high is going to be pretty much normal. It's just the level is going to be the, like the, the whole curve, the whole curve is just pushed down. Right. And, but if you go from no wind at all to 20 mile an hour winds in one day, um, that's going to, it's going to take a while for that, all that wa the wind to blow all the water out of Tampa Bay, for an example is gonna take a while for that wind to blow all that out. So the outgoing tides are gonna be really strong, stronger than normal, because again, that wind, that wind is already pushing all this water out of the Gulf. And now as this, as this water's coming out of the bay, it's, it just has to go that much faster to keep up with the wind that's pushing it, as well as the fact that the Gulf is now a little bit lower than usual. Um, again, not a huge amount, but it's, it's definitely enough to, uh, to factor. So, when uh, say the wind is going from calm to a strong east and we're fishing the the west coast of florida uh, we now know that the outgoing tide is going to be a stronger current and the incoming tide is going to be a weaker current so because it's having that, a because it's having a fight against correct because the now wind. the gravitational pull is is trying to get the water in but the wind is pushing it out and if again if it, if if this was three days into a constant wind from the east, then the incoming tide is going to be coming in to normal time. Just everything's going to be lower. But the fact that it went from calm to strong wind, you know, that factor of all that, all that water moving out um, definitely will make the incoming tide less than it otherwise would be. In some situations, um, it'll actually be, the, the, the current will be reversed of what it should be because of the wind. So it's, it's a big factor. I explain, explain what that means. Uh, meaning that, you know, the tide chart is showing an incoming, like it, it would obviously if it was a really strong incoming, it wouldn't be an issue, but like, say like right here in this curve, you know, it's showing a strong, or oh, sorry, it's showing a weak incoming. This is uh, on the Gulf side. This is, this is for those listening, we're on the, we're on the Gulf coast tide chart. We have a, a low tide that is, it's a, 
a weak low tide. So, mm -hmm. or so it's a high low, I should say. And the low tide is at just under a foot. And then uh, about five hours later, we have a high tide that is only like 0.2 feet above it. And if, if early in the morning there was like no wind and it just started cranking up from the east, um, this little weak incoming tide might get totally overshadowed by the wind. Um, again, like, I, I don't know, this is, I don't know, this isn't precise, but it'll, it, at a minimum, it'll get, it'll get totally weakened, if not potentially overshadowed. Um, so, so it, it, it almost like, that. so someone on the water could almost feel like there was just no incoming tide that day. Right. That. I mean, it would probably, if it did get overshadowed, it wouldn't be by much, but, uh, but correct. But and as soon as this afternoon outgoing started coming on, assuming the wind was still going, then it's going to be it's going to be moving. It's going to be really going out because of the wind factor. Um, and then obviously everything flip flops. You know, if if it was coming out, if the wind is is coming out of the west and then and it's hitting the, the Gulf Coast of Florida, then the, the the tides on average will be elevated compared to normal. And if it's, again, if it's, trend, if the wind is trending up, trending strong, then that's just going to be pushing more water in. So the incoming currents are going to be stronger than the outgoing currents. Uh, and so as far as predicting when the best time to fish will be, the incoming currents will have the advantage given that it's moving a lot more water, which is moving a lot more bait fish, which is going to get those, uh, those predators fired up for, uh, for eating some food. And and just to show an example on, on, how, uh, on how impactful this is, and um, we'll, we'll pick the Indian River. I used to fish out of here for a while. This is where I started kind of learning, uh, learning the ropes with just tides and everything. Because I, I, I never really paid attention to the tide tables. Like I was just, oh man, like this tide chart was wrong. Like I just thought, oh, like, you know, I don't know why, I don't know why the, the water was so low in the winter time one day and then it was like normal the next i was oh yeah that one day just the tide chart was wrong the tide chart was right based on the wind and the moon or the sun, the sun and the moon but it didn't factor in the the you know the crazy wind and the high pressure that came in after a wintertime cold front like that's why the the our winter time our goal side the wintertime cold fronts again we have a high pressure and so the, you know the other factor is the pressure High pressure is pushing down on the water. It is literally moving the water down. Um, and so if you have high pressure plus wind that's going offshore, that's a double whammy on making the tides lower than usual. So on this Gulf Coast, we get the crazy winter, winter low tides. That isn't because it's just winter time. It's because we have high pressure plus an offshore wind is just pulling all that water out. And, uh, and that's, that's the factor. Which happened during that, that one hurricane, right? On Bayshore when it went... Uh... Well, that was that wasn't winter time, but so so bay, the Bay Shore that was that was during the summer, that was during the fall when yeah. that, that was Hurricane Irma that came through, and that was the wind. Like wind is the biggest factor. So hurricanes wind are wind and pressure, and it was low tide to begin with too. Well, but but hurricanes are different because uh, hurricanes are low pressure systems. So the the, actual, the pressure uh, factor actually was was pulling the water up. All else keep held equal. Yeah. But the wind, it was like 50 plus mile an hour wind and or at least 30 for an elevated time. Cause there were a lot of people, I saw some videos of people on Bayshore uh, right here and the wind was moving offshore and it was so strong that it blew all the water out. Like literally this was, this was, this was a uh, totally barren sand. And I, I lived, I lived here for, for four years. Never once did I see this stuff dry. Like not even close. Yeah, and I fish the shoreline a lot. Like there's a there's a pretty good amount of water usually on this on this section. It was bone dry, and again the tide chart didn't show that it was going to be dry. It was it wasn't a factor of the it wasn't some crazy anomaly with the, you know the the moon and the sun orientation relative to the earth. It was the, hey this it was flat windy and the wind was blowing. It was just pushing all that water out. So it, it can be a, obviously a hurricane is that's an oddity. The wind is usually not that strong for a consistent period of time, but it just, it's just an example of the, uh, of the, the impact of it. And just like Lake Okeechobee, right? Let's just talk about somewhere that doesn't even have any tidal impact. Lake Okeechobee has that huge, that huge mound all around it because hurricanes come through it, that friction on the water surface 
is pushing all that water in that massive lake all to one side and it literally can flood mm -hmm. um, if without that without that uh all right. go, go back sorry i interrupted him with hurricane talk uh, go back i think you were talking about indian river and the power of, of oh wind. right yeah yeah so so indian river this it it's unique in the fact that it's just a massive body of water and it doesn't really have much interaction with the atlantic ocean so that the tides are really weak and so but the tides on the ocean side are pretty strong and so sebastian inlet is an area that i fished for a long time i lived in, in palm bay for like seven years and so the, the tide variation on the Atlantic side, let's see, we have here. So it goes, it's about like a two foot up and down movement. So, right, so, you know, the, we're on the tide chart on the Atlantic, the, the lows are right at zero, plus or minus, and the highs are a little bit above two. So we're talking, you know, over two, two feet of variation. And now let me show you just if we go barely, uh, barely inside, we're going to load all the nearby points and there is the here's Sebastian Inlet we're just going to go just to the town of Sebastian so we're just going we're just going just across the uh, the the river and now we have a zero to a point three right so what it did go from zero to two two feet and now it's going from zero to point three so we went from a two foot swing to a point three foot swing and that's because there's just not much, um, not much interaction with the Atlantic Ocean in this massive river. And that's why it's so critical to actually pick the tide station closest to you. Because a lot of, I mean, the one is Sebastian Inlet, and one's the city of Sebastian. There's a lot of people that would just grab one real quick, saying they can't be that that different. Uh, that's nuts. Yeah. So look at the difference. So we're we're 2.7 miles <laughs> away, and the tides could not be any more different. And, and the reason why is because this, you know, this Atlantic Ocean is moving up and down two feet, two feet pretty much every day, every six hours, up and down two feet, up and down two feet. Uh, but this huge body of water in here, the Indian River, the, the only interaction it has with the ocean for like 20 miles north and another 20 miles south is this one little inlet. So there's no way that enough water can go through this little tiny cut to make the river go up by two feet. Um, if, if, this all, if this whole body of land was gone, it would right here along the shoreline would go up by two feet. But the fact that we don't have that, it's like an hourglass, right? You know, those little hourglass things, you flip it over and it has the two big, big, bigger bodies of sand in that one little funnel that it has to go through. And it takes a while, right? If that funnel wasn't there, you'd flip it over and it all just, sand would just fall down immediately. Um, but it has that little funnel so everything's delayed and so the delay the tidal delay from the ocean or the gulf inland is all based on how much constriction there is so i learned this the hard way i was out waiting right here this is when i learned the delay on on tides i was uh i was waiting out here and i had to cross one of these i went i think i crossed over this island right here and there's this little cut yeah joe we, we fished this a long time ago remember that oh, yeah. we used to camp yep. out there and, uh, and so the current was going out when I started fishing. And so I was confident it was, it was in the winter time and I, didn't, I don't, I don't really, I don't wear those waders. I just wear boots. And it was like a little about, it was like knee deep. So I was, I was like, perfect knee deep. The water flow is going out. I'm good. Right. Like the water's, the water's going out. So that means the level is going down. Um, what I didn't factor in is the, the craziness of, of this unique situation where we have all the movement on the ocean and very little movement over here. And so even though the current flow was going out, the actual level was coming up. So when I had to cross back in this cold water, it was, it was no longer knee deep. It was like, it was like waist deep. And uh, so now I'm, I was cold and now I'm soaking wet the rest of the day on uh, trying to drive back. Got my, so long story short, it's, uh, it's very important to understand how the tidal uh, situations uh, just interact because in some, in some cases, the actual current flow doesn't correspond with the height when you're dealing with unique, uh, unique you know, areas like this, like the Sebastian, Sebastian River or Sebastian Inlet. Uh, but, but back to the wind. So, so as we saw, there's like a 0.3 tidal movement based on the sun and the moon, right? 0.3 yep. up and down. 
And that's, that's accurate. It's, I mean, you can predict that for years out, right? I mean, yeah. we, we know what tides are going to be. Yeah. But I, when I used to fish this, you know, I would be out, I used to fish all this area and this is just south of, of the inlet and, and just, and north of there is just a large body of water. It's probably a couple miles wide and it goes, you know, this is like 20 plus miles uh, north. And on a, I would, I would be out some days and, and it would be so much deeper than the day before. And I was just, I'll be fishing down here. I was like, what is going on? Like, uh, it must be like a crazy high tide. Like what's going on? But it wasn't a tide factor at all. It was, it was just the wind. And it, we, what happened is there was a north wind, right? It was a pretty strong north wind. And if you look on this map, right, that north wind is, is having friction surface on this water and it's pushing all this water all the way down and it's building up right here at this funnel point. So all this water is being pushed down and right here it's getting built up. And, and this is where I was fishing and it was like crazy high tide. I was like, what is going on? The water level was high. And again, I thought the tide chart was, was busted. Like, this tide chart prediction is terrible. Um, but the tide chart was good. I just didn't know how to apply the wind variable into it. I didn't even think to, uh, to plan for a higher tide than normal. And the opposite is true here as well, right? If the wind is ripping from the south, now this whole area is gonna be super shallow. And then the northern section of it, as soon as it starts getting constricted, is, is, gonna, be, is gonna be the high point. Um, so same with like Mosquito Lagoon, there's really no tidal impact at all. It's all wind driven. And, uh, and this, this, uh, this cut, Holliver Canal, for those who fish it, even though there's barely, there's relatively no tidal impact from the Atlantic Ocean here, when that wind when that wind is switching, this this current this the current in this channel can get really strong. So very very important is to understand that. I think a really big takeaway for all listeners is wind, the importance of wind. And I, and I know just from watching you over the years, and, and I learned you know through through Luke and, and guys like Tony and Captain Peter Deeks and Captain Mark Johnson, all of our fishing coaches, and you know now Wyatt, et cetera, and Dylan Hubbard. Is, is how important the wind is, not just for this, but just for predicting where you should be, you know, fishing that day. So not, not just for the tide, but also to predict the, the wear. And that's a whole, that's a whole nother, another uh, podcast. We're going to be doing one on the, the whole 90-10 uh, rule that, that where wind does apply to that. It helps you predict the spot. But uh, crazy, right? How so few people talk about wind. They're all, you know, they talk about tide and, um, Obviously, people know wind's important. Obviously, if you're going out offshore, you're going to be checking the wind. But a lot of inshore anglers don't really check wind enough. And I've seen you kind of almost trumpet where it's like, hey, this is one of the most critical factors that I look at first now. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I, I know the wind projections. I'm, I'm upset when the wind projections are, are, aren't what they're supposed to be, which happens a lot. But it's never like totally opposite. Um, so, yeah, I, on every trip, I... I look at the hourly wind projections just to just to know what's going to happen because that's going to be that's a big impact. And uh, and and just an example too, like I, I just moved over here to St. Pete in this area, and and it's crazy. Um, just looking at the canal, if there's a, a wind coming from the south, this this canal is is at the highest points I've ever seen. It one it was a couple weeks ago. It was like a 25 mile an hour wind from the south. And the water was crazy high, by far the highest I've ever seen. And in the actual tide chart, it wasn't like a it wasn't like a big high. It wasn't like a new moon or full moon when when we have the elevated tides. It was just the elevated wind made a big factor. And what was happening is that that wind was just pushing all this water, right? All this water across Tampa Bay, and then it was getting it was basically getting compounded in in this uh, Boca Ciega Bay. It was just getting pushed in there, pushed in there, pushed in there, and it was just rising more and more than it than it normally would. And that's really why, um, as far as the actual da you know, damage of hurricanes, it, most of the damage, the coastal damage is due to water. And it's because the, the, the windy, it's the quadrant that, the quadrant of the hurricane that is actually pushing the strong wind up against the shoreline. That's where the damage is. And it's because the wind is just pushing all that water up on the shore. It's hitting the shore. It's compounding. It's getting, it's basically building, 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 and it will eventually start causing damage when there's enough of it. Obviously like a 20 mile or nine hour wind won't do that. But when you're talking 40 plus for a consistent period, uh, cons you know, um, for a long period of time, 
it's uh it's it's dangerous and as far as just the i say the takeaways too um just to know that the if you want to know that the terms i'd have those up here so the the spring tide or the the, the best tides to fish that are called spring tides and that is when the earth and the moon are are in linear direction they could be on either side of the earth uh, which is going to be the, the full moon and then it could be on the same side of the earth which is the new moon those are going to be the strongest tides because the gravitational pull of the earth and the moon are are hitting the same hitting the earth from the same direction and that's that's the best time in general that's going to be the best time to fish because there's going to be elevated currents which is going to move more bait fish which is going to get the predators fired up the other tide term to know is the neap tide and that is that is the time where the earth and the moon are at a 90 degree angle relative to the earth so basically the the two you know the, the earth and the moon or sorry the sun and the moon are basically like offsetting their um, their power if you will their gravitational force so that's when there's going to be the weakest tides uh, of the month and that's generally going to be the time where the fishing isn't quite as good as the other periods but again just like everything there's always going to be some fish that's uh, that's willing to eat so if you, mm -hmm. if you have time to go fish still fish but just know um, know that those are the the two core best times to fish all else being equal but even then even on the neap tides still still worth getting out there and and giving it a whirl yep and do you mind explaining why if someone is new and doesn't understand why why having you know a higher tide uh correlation and, and more current is going to be better yeah i don't care so much about the height uh, as far as trying to plan the best time to fish i really don't care about the height nearly as much as i care about the movement because the the movement of water is what is is what is triggering the feeding the feeding action so on the on the tide base uh feeds it's the movement of water that is the trigger, not so much the height. Um, like it's very rare that, okay, um, as soon as the, the tide gets right here, this is where the you know, fish are gonna, be, are gonna be eating. No, it's, it's when, is the, when is the current maximized for most areas? Because again, that, that's just moving bait fish. Um, and, and as the current is moving bait fish, a lot of time it'll disorient them. Like those like small little bait fish will sometimes get, get disoriented. Or these predators will just sit down in a pothole on a, like on a grass flat. They're just sitting down on a pothole or behind a rock in, a, in an inlet, and they're just sitting there. They're they're just out of the current, so they can save energy, and they're just sitting there waiting. They're waiting on the current to bring a little bait fish right towards it, and it'll come out, grab it, and then go and go right back down and uh, and just you know save its energy, stay stay out just out of the current, but close enough to where they can see or feel uh, prey coming over. And, and that's when they, again, it's just easier. So they, they feed more on the current periods just because it's easy. And they feed the worst when there's no current at all uh, because, right, because now they have to go out and chase prey down. Like now it's not being brought to them. They have to chase it. And why would they do that? If they know, if, if they know that, oh, I'll just wait another, another couple hours and the, the current's going to be moving fast, like they're just going to save their time, save their energy and just sit and relax and then, um, and then get ready to pounce. Uh, once that current's moving and we've seen that too like fishing there's dock lights joe at uh, little gasparilla um go out there at night and if we would, wouldn't plan it properly we go out there on the slack tide there's no current movement and like it's almost impossible to catch them because those yeah. snook are they're just not feeding but as soon as that wait an hour or two and that water starts moving and they're fired up it's not that they weren't there during the during the slack tide they're still there but they're just they're just not feeding and so they're going to be much less likely to uh to be to be striking lures or, or yeah. even bait fish for that matter. yeah that, that moving water is like the dinner bell ringing baby and all of a sudden you, you see a couple of those little shrimp are getting pulled either in or out and you see little crabs are getting pulled in and out and bait fish and it's just like it's it's crazy it's just all of a sudden it turns on uh like a light switch pretty wild so the big I don't know if it's a million or a billion dollar question. Everyone always asks, well, hey, should I fish incoming or outgoing? You know, there used to be, you know, some old sayings that, oh, yeah, you want, for inshore fishing, you only want to fish incoming if that's all you could fish. Uh, I, I don't know that that's necessarily true. What are your thoughts? So, yeah, I, I think that's the word. I think it's, it's a big mistake that many people have is to focus on one tide because, and I can say that from experience because I did that for many years. 
I would only fish the incoming tide and the top end of the incoming tide because all I knew to do was to go get catch live bait, catch white bait, and then go pitch it under mangroves. And, and that's when it's best to do that type of fishing in, in many cases, assuming because right at low tide, there's not enough water under most of those mangroves to even, to even fish. And, and what I've realized uh, once I finally, um, finally just made myself start fishing whenever I could, and instead of just targeting that one specific tide, is that now some of my best fishing is actually on like the outgoing tide or even low tide situations. And it's almost like fishing a barrel, right? At, at the lower tides, those fish have less places to hide. And so like now my least, my least favorite time to fish is like those really big high tides because those fish can just be in so much, so much more area and they're harder to find. Um, in many cases like fishing mangroves, I, and now I do almost all artificial. So when they get way up in the mangroves, it's just really hard to get to them. If you, if you have live bait, you can chum them out. That's what a lot of people do. That's what I used to do. Uh, but now I like to get out there before the high and, I, and fish the trees as they're just starting to get up into the trees or as the water's going down as they're starting to push out of them. Um, so I would say it's a big mistake to focus on one tide versus the other. Um, the, the best advice I could give is to just focus on current. And an easy way, the, the bad thing about current is that tide charts don't really show current. It's just the tide height. And the good news, though, is that there's an easy way to derive the current flow based on a tide chart like this. And, and it's the slope of the line, right? Because just seeing this graph, uh, for those looking, uh, for those listening, I'll explain it. So we have, you know, uh, this is the Gulf Coast of Florida. So we have in the morning at 7 a.m., we have a, a 1.2 foot tide. And then about four hours later, or yeah, about five hours later, we, it goes down by like 0.2 feet. And another five hours later, it goes up by like 0.3. And then overnight, it drops down considerably. And it's the slope of the line that we need to focus on. So I highly recommend when you are looking at tides, don't look at the number-based tide graphs where it just shows a bunch of numbers. It's just, for me, that's, I'm, a, I'm a visual learner. So I like to just look at these tide charts at the graphs, the line graphs where it goes up and down, up and down. And the slope of the line, the steepest part of the slope is when the most current is gonna be happening. Again, assuming that there's no crazy wind variable or anything like that. So looking at this at 4 a.m. is gonna be the strongest current of the day. And I can, I can know that in three seconds, just looking at this graph because it's easy to see, right? Just look at the slope of the line, the steeper the slope, the more current you have. The flatter the slope, the less current you have. So in the middle of the day, we have a, a, a really a, a, a low that is, that is actually kind of high. It's, a, it's a, a high low, if you will, right in the middle of the day. And so there's just hardly any water movement. So the middle of the day is really not gonna be the best time to fish. Um, if I could, on this day in particular, I would get out there early and take advantage of this, the strong tide, the strong current, which happens to be incoming, but if I would like it just as good if it was flip-flop, I would take advantage of that, that, strong, that strong tide and, uh, and knowing that the middle of the day is gonna be weak. Yeah, you could, and you could be back by, and look at that, the chart below it, it says that. Yeah, five, so. Five, six, seven, eight, you could be back at home, boat or kayak, all cleaned off by eight in the morning, have your coffee and uh, you've already caught two inch short slams. Boom, bam, yeah, sham. So, yeah, the ultimate shortcut is just to use smart fishing tides because you know, we have, we have pr the predictive analysis down here, which takes, you know, it takes the tide table stuff along with the, the, the other variables like wind speed, wind direction, um, pressure changes. It takes all of it into account and it'll spit out a, uh, an actual curve to show you when the best, to, you know, based on, based on the data, the best times the fish will be. And it's, and it's, and it's been, it's been, really, we've been doing this for almost about a year now, I guess. Uh, but it's, it's good. I mean, it is, it is, again, it's taking the details and putting it in just a nice, easy to read format where you can just look at it and know automatically what to do. Yep. And so that's the, that shows you the time. The other thing that we solve for is where to fish right and that's really the most critical thing because you could be there at the right time and if you're in a dead zone you ain't going to catch diddly squat and uh, that's why we created that insider club it was is everything luke and i 
which was around, you know, back when, when we were struggling and super inconsistent and, and quite frustrated and focused on all the wrong things, like just, you know, all the shiny object things that are out there that don't necessarily help you catch more fish unless you're at the right spot at the right time. And that's, that's the whole focus. We do little calls or little, you know, um, webinars like this every single week. Uh, we're actually getting on satellite maps every single week and showing all of our members. We're now over 14,000 members from Texas to Florida where it started up to really Virginia, even New Jersey area and uh, showing you guys where to go out there and catch inshore slams and uh, doing some near shore stuff as well. We just got back from the Keys here recently and did a little offshore stuff. So, you know, always doing a little bit more, but the primary focus is, is the inshore slams, the redfish and speckled trout and snook and, and flounder and, and black drum and uh and, and cheap said obviously you know depending on the season spanish mackerel so hope you guys will join us and that's all at saltstrong.com and the kind of the the big news that we uh we've been doing here in the last couple of months which is two reasons why the whole club exploded uh, we were we were celebrating ten thousand members right luke at the at the beginning of the year last time you got a haircut and now we're at fourteen thousand. i mean just it took us five years to get from zero to ten thousand and, and now you know and five months, six months, we go from 10 to 14. And it was one, we started offering tackle and, and not just tackle 20% off pretty much all of the best stuff out there. And another thing that separates us from everyone else is we don't have sponsors. And so we personally spend our own money and, and buy pretty much every reel that's ever been made, all the best, most popular rods, lines from braid to mono to floor. We test the stuff out and we tell our members, here's what's the best value. And uh, so we don't want to be a bass pro that just provide. I think that that's one of the biggest disservices to fishermen is just having this unlimited supply of crap they can buy. I mean, wouldn't you rather go into a store that had the best stuff that was truly the best value and you had coaches there that had actually tried it out and can stand by it and show video proof like, hey, this is why this is the best value. And that's what we do. And you get 20%, all of our members get 20% off uh, everything. So let's just say it was, a Daiwa reel, which we're big, real big fans of because we've tested, you know, Daiwa and Shimano and Penn, all the other big ones out there, 20% off uh, all of your, uh, your gear. So that's been big. And number two, now that e-learning is cool, you know, my kids, uh, you know, they're now doing e-learning with their, their teachers. And that's essentially what we're doing is just teaching people how to fish online. And you'd be shocked. I mean, blown away on, on how much improvement you can see in a short amount of time from learning this stuff online. I mean, right now, if you guys made it this far in this video, I'm guessing you probably learned something. And this is just one little video. We have, I don't know, six or 700, might be over a thousand now. Um, it's crazy how many different videos we have on every topic you can imagine for incident members. This stuff that you can't find out there on, uh, on YouTube. And we try to simplify it. Most of these videos we do for incident members, 10 minutes or less. We try to do it super quick cut all the fluff and, uh, and just help you save time. And of course, help you save money on tackle. Well, you got the map pulled up there, Lukey? Yeah, and I just wanted to show the, the you know, well, if you're an inshore got angler. a ton of spots. Yeah, if you're an Those are all fishing reports. And, and you like catching redfish, sea trout, flounder, snook, you know, throughout the year. And then the migrational, like tarpon, uh, triple tail cobia. This is the place. There's, there's no better resource for you in both the, the, the breadth of education and, and the depth as well as the community. So this, this, uh, this map that you're looking at, this is the community, this is the geographical pins of all the community reports. So now we have over 13,000 members, and many of which are posting their own reports. And what is, since we were talking about Tampa, we'll just zoom in. And there <laughs> is an absolute ridiculous amount of posts. So every one of those pins is an actual like real time fishing report from either ourselves or, or members showing you know where they were what they caught what lures and or bait they were using i mean it's uh that's wild dude tampa is packed so what, yeah, what so, filter do you just use and so this is just the month of june and okay. so we can we can now say okay now that we have there's so many pins it's hard to, it's, it's impossible to look at all of them so now it's okay let's let me just see what members have done in june and these different reports um, not only show you know what fish were caught and what lures were used but more importantly Many of them show details like, like the tips and tactics, like, hey, I was fishing 
the 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 you know the on the edge of the grass slats in three to five feet of water with the with the jig, or it was it hey incoming tide was it and the the fish were up under the mangroves or under the docks you know whatever the case was so just a wealth of knowledge and we're building some more uh, some more filters and more analysis tables on this but uh, but more importantly again it's just about uh, just a massive community of of like like minded anglers who are who are just you know willing and and eager to uh, to, to share share tips. Cool. Yeah. And I hope uh, if you are a member, I know a lot of our members listen to the podcast. Thank you guys. You are, you are our family. You're the foundation of the, the whole company and we can't do it without you. So we really appreciate you. And, uh, and it's been cool. This is now five years and, and a big chunk, I think the vast majority of our original members, we started with, you know, zero it was Luke and I, and we got a hundred. I remember thinking, Oh, I got a hundred. And most of the same original people five years ago are still now members today, which is, uh, which is really, really awesome and a testament to, to just how powerful that network is and, uh, and really just what a, a positive, like just helpful. There's no cursing. There's no belittling, no negativity. So guys, we appreciate all of you for keeping it clean and, and uh, just having amazing people. And of course, if you're not a member, come join us, saltstrong.com. It is the only fishing club that gives you 20% off all the best stuff out there plus shows you where to fish every week, plus gives you this online community to ask anything that you want. There's never a dumb question. And, uh, and, and just truly people that want to help you out and help you save time and, uh, and, and money. And uh, man, just that, that network and the community, it's, uh, it, it is so powerful. I mean, we learn stuff, right? I mean, we've, we've been able to go catch more fish just based on uh, what someone has, has shared with us and even learning little new techniques. I mean, like with Marcos learning a new way to catch 40 inch snook on a fake shrimp, who would have thought? Uh, and that's all because of the ins the power of that network of people sharing. So. Yeah. And this is the only investment in fishing you can make that, that the owners are so confident that it produces results that actually gives a 365 day, 100% satisfaction. Guarantee. Oh snap. How can they do that? How can they do that? I'll tell you how. It's, it's as long as we can go legally is, is one, uh, one year. And so we went the absolute max. Some not, companies not legally, but based on, based on our merchant, we, we can't, we can't go longer than a year. So that's what well, it is. It's a year. That means legally, but yeah, some companies have 30 days money back guarantee. Some 60, very few have 90. We want a full 365 days. We we're that confident. We want you yeah. in there. Yeah, and again, and this is even any, just the species is really species based. We have a ton of members in Texas. Um, it's like thirty percent of the total membership is in Texas now, and uh, just really throughout the entire Southeast. So, um, yeah, if you haven't yet tried it, I recommend. And uh, it is it is just a wealth of knowledge. And no matter how advanced you are, we have a lot of full time guides. Um, it is impossible not to learn as long as you just spend a little bit of time looking through the community posts it's impossible not to learn some game changing tips on uh, because again, we have 13,000 members posting their, their own helpful analysis and, and tips and tactics. And it has been, it has been mind blowing just how much like me, for me personally, just how much my game has improved simply by just, just looking through that community every once in a while and, uh, and just picking out some, uh, some cool things and trying them. Cause in many cases, some, some unique stuff that these Texas members are doing, are working really well over here and a lot of the things that that you know us florida members have been posting the texas members are, are showing that it's working great great over there as well so um you know no better way to grow than to just increase your network yeah buddy all right this has been a good one this has been super helpful i uh i even learned some some stuff on this one yep so tide tables are always good for the the main factors but that what they won't what they are 100 percent will not account for is the wind and the pressure and that's when it's on us to uh just to know that it's going to be it's going to be higher or lower or later or earlier um and it's it's uh it's, it's an art half science half art so just be just be mindful of those of those you know of those impacts to the tide table and so for whatever area you're fishing based on, you know, the funnels, if you will, um, you know, the, the results will, will impact a little bit, but just, just be mindful of it. And over time, you'll see that you're going to get more and more accurate on knowing how, how much and how far the deviations from that, that tide chart will actually be on the water. Pay attention to that wind direction and speed critical and pick the tide 
Because I've done that before. You're in a hurry and you just pick one that looks close by and all of a sudden you're like, man, that was an hour off. Uh, that's uh, it's, it's pretty critical. Um, cool. That was awesome. Thank you guys again. If you're listening via iTunes or Stitcher or uh, Spotify and you want to go see some of the, the video footage, we'll have all that. It's saltstrong.com forward slash. That's that slash podcast. So saltstrong.com forward slash podcast. You can also join the club there as well and search your 365-day, 100% money-back guarantee trial if you're not uh, 100% thrilled. We want everyone to walk away and say, man, that was the best investment I ever made in myself when it comes to fishing. So I hope to see you in the club. For you current members, we really appreciate you. Hit us up. We're here to serve you and help you. If we can do anything, let us know. Otherwise, we will talk to you on the next podcast. See ya. Peace.